بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد حجامة كابين is an emphasized سنة ما كان أحد يشتكي إلى رسول الله anybody that came to the Nabi of Allah and complained إلا قال احتجم utilize the process of حجامة كابين إن أفضل ما تداويتم به الحجامة amongst the most virtuous forms of cure and shifa is in kapin خير يوم تحتجمون فيه then the best of days which you should do it is the 17th, 19th, 21st وما مررت بملأ من الملائكة when I went for Mi'raj Every angel that I pass illa qalu alayka bil hijama ya Muhammad O Muhammad Hold steadfast unto hijama Al-shifa'u fi thalathatin Shifa is in three One is in honey And second is The blade of the hijam The blade Wa shartati mihjamin the blade of the hajjam, the person that's doing the procedure. In amthalama tadawaitum bihi al hijam wal qustul bahriyu. Between hijam and qustul bahri, these are amongst the most beneficial forms of shifa. Wa alaykum bil qust. Gee, let us do some research about qustul bahri which is available now recently through the baraka and fikr of some ulama to revive the sunnah khayru dawa al hijam among the best of cures and remedies is hijam ma zala jibril yusini bil hujm jibril alayhi salam continued to emphasize hijam حتى ظننت أنه لا بد منه until I thought so it would become very necessary it was imperative فإنها شفاء من إثنين وسبعين داع it has cure for 72 sicknesses and illnesses so a person who performs hijama نوايات it removes the toxic blood lightens the back back pains sharpens the eyesight خير ما تداويتم به الحجامة والفست Amongst the best things which you will use for your cure is حجامة in fast So Jabir bin Abdullah رضي الله عنه وزد المقنة And he said that I will not leave until he is treated for cup in Fahad Nabi alayhi salam say There is a shifa a cure in it Now Hijama and fast are two different processes. Hijama is the common cupping where you have the cupping cups. And fast is phlebotomy. So Ibn Qim has explained that hijama cupping purifies the external body. And phlebotomy is beneficial for the deeper parts of the body. And... Uh, Kapin is more safer than phlebotomy, especially in, in younger people. And a person who's strong, then they can do phlebotomy. And it is good for heart diseases which stem from the congestion of the blood, high blood pressure, heart, lung disease. And in today's times, we can ask the muftiya on giving blood, but the person who gives blood, it is as if it is phlebotomy, because you're removing blood from the external internal system, and cupping is from the external where the toxins collect in your body, that removes that layer of toxins. So when we do cupping also, we have to be very careful. We go to the professionals, the experts who have experience, especially an ill person who is treating treatment. Ahlak al-alam arba'ah. They say the dunya, the world, 
will be destroyed by four types of people Nis Hakim, an incomplete ruler, a, a incompetent ruler, or Nisfu Faki, and a half scholar, or Nisfu Nahwi, and a half linguist, or Nisfu Tabib, and an incompetent half a doctor. Why? Because a incompetent ruler, Yufsidul Buldan, the country will be wiped out. And a half a scholar, Yufsidul Adiyan, he will wipe out your deen. Wa Nisfu Nahwi, Yufsidul Lisan, and a linguist will wipe out your language. And a doctor who is incompetent, Yufsidul Abdan, he will destroy your body, destroy your health. So it is important that we go to the experts because of the incorrect piercing methods of the skin which can result in damage to the nerves, damage to the blood vessels. It can even potentially be fatal to patients. So without uh, handling disposal of the fluids, disposal of the instruments, sanitization, there may be a possibility, la ilaha illallah, risk of spread of infection as well. And from HIV to hepatitis to other infectious disease. So al hajm in the Arabic language comes from Filugat al mas Mas is a type of absorption, a type of extraction, type of suction. So something which diminishes in volume, where we reduce the blood volume through vacuum, through sucking. And in the olden days where they used to use either leaching, which is common in the 21st century of drawing blood, or in the olden days where they used to use animal horns, modern methods of bamboo, glass, plastic cups. So not just going in the corner gullies of Medina Munora in Makkah al Mukarramah and find somebody that is cupping, but we need somebody who's, who's experienced. Then there's a thing called dry cupping, but its therapeutic effectiveness is very limited, it's very restricted. And uh, it may have temporary benefits, but ideally we want to do cupping, remove the toxins. This was the Sunnah of Anbiya Ali Musallatu was salam, 124,000. We go back in history amongst the oldest Egyptian medical books, approximately 1550 BC. They describe the bleeding and the removing of pathogens from the body. 2200 BCE in the Egyptians and the Assyrians, historians have noted 3300 BCE. If we look at Chinese traditional medicine, we find that it is very emphasized and it is a common practice. It can be used for injury. Rasulullah cupped his foot when it was bruised. For headaches, somebody complained, Nabi Alayhi Salaam encouraged for black magic jadu that uh, Nabi Alayhi Salaam was cupped on his head when he was affected with sihar. This is mentioned in Zadu al Ma'ad. Likewise, poison. Nabi Alayhi Salaam was given poison by the Jewish woman and uh, Nabi Alayhi Salaam felt the pain and he performed hijama. So, it is an emphasized sunnah, different places for cupping as well. The white of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, Nabi alayhi salam did it on his upper back and on the back of his neck, the white of Bukhari, where Nabi alayhi salam was in ihram and he did it in the center of his head. The white of Javi radiallahu anhu, Nabi alayhi salam was seated with cupping on his hip for he had a sprain there. Then a riwayat of Anas bin Malik radiallahu anhum when Nabi alayhi salam was in ihram and he was treated on top of his foot for pain that he had there. So likewise Nabi alayhi salam cupped when he was fasting so Muhaddisin explained the permissibility of cupping when a person is fasting. So we said the head between the shoulders, area between the shoulder blades, that's around the seventh thoracic vertebra, which is generally done 
on uh, general health and general vigor. Obviously, where a person has certain illness and sickness, then the person who is administering should be an expert to know exactly where. So researchers have said there are over 98 positions and places where hijama can be performed. Then the dates. So Ibn Sirin used to dislike li ra'sil hilal wa yaqul innaha la tanfa' in the beginning of the month up to the 15th. He advised it is very harmful. Then uh, in the riwayat which we just did now, performing on the 17th, 19th and 21st riwayat of Ibn Majah. So those dates there. Then when specific dates, riwayat of Ibn Umar an, the riwayat of Ibn Majah, ala barakatillahi yawm al khamis. So ideally, if we have to do it, وَاحْتَجِمُوا يَوْمَ الْإِثْنَيْنِ وَالثُلَثَاء So the riwayat of Ibn Umar advisably, preferably Monday and Tuesdays and Thursdays. Ideally if we have to do it in the flow of order priority on a Tuesday, if not possible then a Thursday, if not then on a Monday. So priority wise. And some fuqaha have said it is mustahab on a Saturday um, after dates that I mentioned, Tuesday, Thursday and Monday are mustahab. On a Saturday and Wednesday it is forbidden and on Fridays it is makru. So khalaq al-dhar yawm al-arbi'a So on, on, on the Wednesday Kab Ahbar radiallahu mentioned that uh, there is a possibility of illness. So on Wednesdays we should abstain and uh, Saturdays, even Fridays. Some scholars have tried to reconcile. So combining all the riwayat, and we're not going to get into that now, but if you had to just try to find a middle road, then the reconciliation would be 17th, 19th and 21st, whichever day it coincides, you can do it, it will be permissible. Ideally identify from the 17th, 19th and 21st, identify a Tuesday, Thursday and Monday on a priority wise. If we get a Tuesday, very good, do it on that day, if there's no Tuesday, do it on a Thursday, there's no that day, then do it on a Monday. If there is no Monday, then the rest of the days. That's a reconciliation. Some ulama, other ulama have said that uh, with regards to these dates, since the riwayat are the narrations, a chain of narrators are weak. Hafiz Ibn Hajar Asqalani Rahtulali in his Fatul Bari has mentioned. وَلِكَوْنِ هَذِهِ الْأَحَادِيثِ لَيْمْ يَسِحْ مِنْهَا الشَّيْءِ Since we have not found any narration which is credit worthy or credible, we will not go by the opinion of choosing specific dates. And it is mentioned, Ibn Isaac has said, وَكَانَ أَحْمَدْ يَحْتَجِمُ أَيَّ وَقْتْ هَاجَ بِهِ الدَّمْ وَأَيَّ سَعَةْ كَانَتْ the habit of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal rahimahullah was that it, he, he did not specify any of these specific dates. So we should try to reconcile if we can do the reconciliation better, Allahu Alam bis sawab. So worst case scenario, if a must person miss those dates, then the dates, but some uh, researchers have said that up to the 27 maximum, but in the books, it has been mentioned the closest to the 15, 17, 19 is the best, um, 17, 19, 21st is the best. And then after that, the days that follow, and the more you go to the end of the month, the more you should abstain.
Now we see the full moon after that. So what's the significance of the full moon in not doing cupping on those dates? That um, the moon has an effect on the sea, it produces high tides, and like that it has an effect on our body. So you even see the term lunatic is de 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 derived from the word lunar, because the moon has an effect on our behavior. And that's why we encourage to fast on these dates here, 13th, 14th, and 15th is fasting dates, and it, it synchronizes, it looks like it's systematic and Allah's system is perfect. So when there is a full moon, there's a lot of energy, rise of anger, flared tempers, people have conditions of epilepsy, migraines, high blood pressure, that increases dramatically. Then studies have shown that there's more assaults during a full moon, more crime, more animal bites, uh, fertility, menstruation, birth rate, melatonin levels are influenced. Admittance into hospitals and the emergence are caused more. So traffic accidents, crime, suicides are more common during a full moon. And it's another topic on its own, but the Satanists, the people of Jadu and black magic thrive and they have rituals during the full moon. Likewise, also, if you go and speak to the people who do Amaliyat also, they will tell you that the moon has an impact. So on a specific date, specific time, in a certain Ta'awiz, amulet is written, it will have an effect as well. The time when we should do it ideally in the early part of the morning, before probably 10 a.m., while the blood is still settled and the body circulation hasn't gone to a more advanced level, once a person starts his body activities and he starts eating, then the digestive system, the internal organs are in motion. So try to do it in the early part of the morning. And uh, a person, after doing the hijama, you should make sure that it's disinfected. Um, a person should preferably not go to sleep because of a possibility of blood clots de developing. And uh, after hijama, we are recommended to eat healthy foods, proteins, body fluids, rehydrate, stay away from caffeine, sugary drinks. A person should avoid showering immediately after, cupping as well. And Ibn Qim has mentioned that uh, after a person baths, he shouldn't cup. So prior to cupping, we shouldn't have a ghusl. Cupping is better in summer than winter. A person who is not afraid or he's feeling very cold, he shouldn't cup according to Qayyim. Why? Because the blood does not surface. And he says that it differs according to the time, people, place, climate, ages, and physical condition. So people who want to cup also should not cup on a full stomach. So person who's eating a full breakfast, this is against the principle of hijama because the digestive organs get engaged and busy and blood is removed from those areas which you are going to cup as well. So you wouldn't, would not take maximum benefit. So it's advisable a patient should have an empty stomach and uh, when the toxins collect at night and in the morning when, when we have a meal, um, that affects the process. Likewise, a, ex, a person who is in excess of perspiration, as it is said, do not bleed the one who is sweating and do not sweat the one who is bleeding. So the adverse effects of that as well. Then, uh, Normally, a person can give sadaqah, do some amal, make dua, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the procedure, ya Allah, make it that uh, the process is successful, etc, etc. There are a lot of benefits of cupping. It uh, helps in hypertension, blood pressure. So a person who has high blood pressure, etc. A person who is feeling weak, it gives him strength. Um, then a person who has abnormal ECG readings, ECG patterns, a Syrian Hijama Institute had done research. Then a person who has abnormal RBC count, HB thrombocytes, person who has cholesterol and dry glycerides, 
75% of patients who had high levels, it neutralized any person who has blood glucose levels, uh, glucose, etc. people who are diabetic. 92.5% in the study showed a reduction. Uric acid abnormal, a person who has pain, gynecological disorders, infertility, dermat dermatological skin disorders, eczema, dermatitis, neurological disorders, stroke, spinal cord injury, certain types of epilepsy, gastrointestinal disorders, whether it's for inflammation, gastritis, nausea, vomiting, hemophilia, um, anemia. So these two conditions, we have to be very careful also not to do cupping because it's a genetic disorder and uh, we have to know the patient as well. A person who's anemic as well shouldn't be. Uh, somebody who's pregnant as well shouldn't be. So there are much benefits for this great amal. We should just have yaqeen in the words of Allah in His Rasul and not in the knowledge of the people of the world which is limited, restricted based on trial, error, flaws and uh, restricted. The amal for today was also the daytime will come where a person will not be protected illa man haraba bidinihi except the person who runs for his deen to the mountains from one den to another to protect himself from all the fitness.